Today, we welcome our guest, Peter Bowler. Peter is a former professional cricketer and since retiring has been on a mission to help children move better. He is currently the CEO of FMS Schools based in the UK. On this episode, we cover elite athlete development, the current state of youth health and wellness, and ways to change the culture within physical education. So let's get going with this episode of the Movement Podcast, powered by FMS. So real happy to have on uh, a gentleman I've known, Pete, we've probably gotten to know each other the last three or four years quite well, spent a lot of time chatting it up through uh, through Zoom, um, and actually you came over and, and we started talking about physical education, but, but before we get into that, Peter, I want you to kind of give our audience a little bit more of a background on you, your history, really your sports history, because you got quite an extensive sports history, so I'm um, really happy to have you, Peter Bowler from... Uh, FMS UK, and, and we partnered up with him on physical education. But, you know, kind of give us, a, a, everyone, a sense of your history and your background. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks, Lee. Thanks, Gray, for inviting me on. And pleasure to be here. I'm, gee, my, God, thinking back now, I'm, I'm 18 years retired now. So my pro uh, career finished in 2004. I'd been a, a professional cricket player. Uh, I don't know whether most of your audience uh, know about cricket in, in the UK and around the world. And uh, I was very lucky to to play pro sports for 20 years. It was like an almost an extension of being at school. So I guess, you know, you come out of, out of school and into college and you you play. And I, and I was lucky enough to fall into a pro career. And uh, it was like uh, waking up in every every day doing what you love for 20 years. It was very exciting. Uh, I was lucky, you know, if you hang around in a game for 20 years, you tend to achieve things because of longevity. Um, I certainly uh, didn't achieve greatness, but I did get to play with some great players and watch what they do and perhaps understand the little difference that takes a sort of, a, I suppose, a, a jobbing professional like me, uh, the difference between somebody like me over 20 years and, and a brilliant um a great player. Well, first of and, all, let uh, me say 20 years in any pro sport is a commendable feat because you're in a very small, small group. And you said something there. Do most cricket players go through college or university before they become pro? Or does it work like baseball where you can do it either way? You can do the college route and develop yourself athletically, or you can get plucked right from um, you know, high school and go right into a development league. And how does that work? Yeah, just like baseball, uh, Gray, you can get pl- you can be a pro cricketer at 15. Okay. <laughs> um, wow. And, uh, and so I, uh, I actually in- studied my pro sports career. In, uh, so, yeah, just a, l- a little bit like baseball, you'll get some who'll go through and do university, um, which is your college uh, sort of combination, and then come out at the end of it and go into pro sports, sort of mix the two and then come out the other end. But actually what you'll find is most young cricketers, if they're really, um, uh, they're, they're really good. They, they, they come straight into pro sports at 18 okay. and go, jump straight into the game. So, uh, I think that, you know, I, I love American football. I love your sort of collegiate system over there. I think it's wonderful that, 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 that you can mix college and getting your education and then still be a pro at the end of it. Uh, one of the problems in cricket is you get a long uh, uh, young people, they, they go into pro sports at 18, they get conditioned and uh, they come out at 32 and they've never done anything else but play sport and they're just not prepared for the, the, the rest of their lives. And that, that can be quite difficult. I, I started a law degree in the dressing room when I was about 28, 29. <laughs> I started preparing, uh, reading books. People would say, you know, wow, what are you doing tonight? Well, I'm, I'm sat in the toilet of my hotel room because the only decent lighting in the hotel room is in the toilet <laughs> above the, uh, the sink. And with my books spread over on a seat, um, doing, a, doing a law degree. So I knew the, the, end, was, uh, the end was coming pretty, uh, pretty soon. And uh, I was getting ready for it, but not all young players are. And real quick, if you could uh, tell our listeners, what say four countries are considered powerhouses in cricket? So, so when 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 cricket is represented and the best of the best are meeting up, where are they coming from? Well, look, traditionally it's always been Australia and, and England. Okay, uh, and then in the sixties and seventies, the West Indies became an amazing powerhouse of players. They had an incredible. 
uh, side came in out of the 70s and I was lucky to play against and with a, a number of that team in my time. And then recently, as the game, the shortened version of the game, they're called the 2020 game, has blown in, in India, suddenly Asia has become an absolute powerhouse of cricket um, as well. So the economics of the, the game has changed. And, and where is, um, you know, you can quite rightly call yourself a, a, a world champion uh, winning the NFL within your country, then 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 cricket is really much a, a world game. And what you have to do is represent your country really to be at the peak of your game in your within, within the sport. So, um, you know, that's how it's sort of structured. And I was very lucky. I, I got to do it for 20 years I was mainly a rugby player, rugby and cricket player as a youngster in Australia growing up. So I was dual sports. But actually, when I started, and you guys will be the same, uh, we played all sorts of sports. I played tennis. I played different codes of rugby. Uh, we did all. We did. We played every sport available to us. And I think, from a physical point of view, it made a huge difference to me having a long career. Is all the different sports I played as a youngster and how that developed my body. No, and that's I, one question, Peter, I have is, you know, a lot of our, you know, obviously we're in the sports performance world primarily. That's where Gray and I've always kind of had our niche. And, and of course, that's where you spent 20 years, 20 year career. And I think a lot of people, you know, from you, I, I, and I'm curious to find out what allows someone at that level sustain 20 years. I mean, you know, what, what can, you know, obviously what everybody want to know, what's the secret? What, what is the secret sauce that a, that you can be in a professional sport for 20 years? Well, I, I can tell you right now, don't lift too many weights. Find out how <laughs> okay. your body, find yeah. out how your body moves. Uh, you want elasticity. You want strength within your uh, ranges of motion. So find out what they, they are, find out what your legitimate movement patterns are, pile your capacity onto those legitimate patterns that suit you, look for elasticity and strength in tendons, don't pile extra muscle onto a body that's actually built to carry a certain weight, find out what your weight is, get as strong as you can for that weight, and then you've got longevity. No, I think that's that's great advice. And a way that I think Lee and I have tried to prove that mathematically is that if your numbers in the weight room are going up and your numbers on the functional movement screen are going down, it's a counterproductive endeavor. And Bruce Lee said it eloquently in his prime, one extra pound of muscle that actually changes my movement for the worse doesn't need to be carried. And even Bruce Lee said, the only reason I started doing some bench presses for the Hollywood roles, not necessarily because it allowed me to fight at my pinnacle of excellence. So packing on the extra muscle is almost like a peacock getting extra feathers. It doesn't make you fight better. It just makes you look a little bit more imposing from a distance. And, and I think that's excellent advice. So at the point at which somebody's gym routine is counterproductive to their sport or function, because you can get a quick signature on that. Um, I think it's right. And everything you said uh, actually goes into the soup of superior reaction time because you're talking about elasticity and, and you know fluid movement and the ability to respond in a three-dimensional space and anything that would inhibit your reaction time. We know that when people get injured and they come back at 80%, they're a step slow. That's a completely different athlete. And they don't realize that, that you know, you're, you're basically at a significant disadvantage. So having these baselines that we get on you when you're healthy and asking you to achieve those after a training cycle or after rehabilitation is just a proper entry point. And so many people say, well, I feel fine. I think I'm going back. And that may have worked 200 years ago. It doesn't work anymore. There's too many ways to cover up dysfunction and pain. So um, I would say to you guys, see, because you, you're looking at sportsmen all the way through your careers. Um, the greatest sportsmen I've ever seen have a unique thing, um, an aesthetic. It, their, their, their movement is almost beautiful. Edwin Moses, uh, Muhammad Ali, a chap called Michael Holding was a wonderful bowler in cricket. Um, Roger Federer, the way he moves on a tennis court. And what you're doing is you're seeing a perfect combination of movement and body and uh, training, neurological training, 
all combining into something. When you watch it, it's like a ballet. And uh, the the truth is that the hardest punch that you will ever receive, and I'll take you back to the great boxers of the 70s and 80s and 90s, uh, is all down to speed. So somebody says to me, what's the difference between a club cricketer and a professional cricketer and international cricketer? It's levels of speed that go up. It's reaction times that get less and less and less. And your ability to respond to the less time that you have, because the moment you don't have time, your balance gets compromised and you're done. Well, so it's you said something very important there, and I think people hear somebody of your background and wisdom say that, and they immediately Google, what's the best speed package for my eight-year-old? What's the best speed exercises? And I want our listeners to know, that's not what you said. What you said is, anything getting in the way of your speed is what you should be working on. The speed programs are there, and if you're appropriate for that speed development program, but what Lee and I have built an entire career on is saying, oh, you want power? Let's go back and see why that ankle is not contributing to that, and there's a mobility problem or something like that. So it, I honestly think vetting what could be interfering with your speed from a developmental, a functional level, a energy system level, a symmetry level, you know, reaction time. Look at all the different things that could hurt your speed. And if they're all gone, now you can start working on speed. And I, I want people to hear what you said, because what you said is eloquent. And, and speed does define the ultimate uh, level of the way you're going to get to play. But going right toward the speed packages that the pros use to maintain their speed may not be the program to help you develop your speed. And I, and, and I think a lot of parents and athletes that are aspiring need to hear that because what you actually said earlier is, I developed my base and body awareness in multiple sport environments, even though you were probably more gifted in a couple. So, Yeah, I think, the, I think that's right. I, uh, and also, if you you also look at at us as a one system, um, I'll give a tennis player example: Djokovic. Uh, Djokovic ten years ago would be beaten by Federer and um, and the lefty from Spain uh, regularly in the fourth and fifth match, uh, sets of matches, and he couldn't beat them, and he'd even just break down and not finish the matches. And he went and changed his diet, and he found the change in his diet helped him breathe better later in the, the matches and allowed him to stay on his nose as opposed to going on his mouth. Now, you watch an international boxing match. The moment you see two combatants, you see one of them breathing through their mouth with their mouth open, you know that that, that fellow is toast. So how we breathe and we calm ourselves, and I know this is central to everything you guys do, is, you know, people don't understand. You, you want to look at somebody who's been on the weights and looks muscular and very, very athletic, but the biggest muscle they have in their body is their diaphragms. And it's what gives them postural control and ability to control their breathing. And it's the breathing that will take them to higher levels of athleticism because it calms them down and it slows everything when the reactions are needed and everything needs to be quick. So it's a system that works all the time, and the greatest sportsmen have an ability to regulate all of that in key moments when speed matters and calmness matters. And that's what I have observed for 20 years, and I certainly did the best I could with what I had, but what I got the ability to do is see great pl players doing all of those things in a combination. And guess what? They do it when everybody is struggling under pressure. No, I, that that's so well stated. We we added a breathing screen to our menu of tools simply because if that's broken, we will actually look for places to fix that within within movement. But early in my career, through associations and a Reebok contract, I got to work with the Williams sisters, Andy Roddick, and got to be down at the Boletary Tennis Academy. And the one thing I noticed is you've seen the 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 service where the uh, tennis player will sort of fiddle with the strings on their racket, readjust the strings, and obviously they're going through more of a mental uh, kata or routine than they are readjusting those strings. 
but all the greats would also adopt a completely different breathing sequence in those pauses or moments when everybody else could get nervous and anxious and focus on the crowd or or the the score or something like that they would go right back into it they would have a fault on a serve or something like that they'd mess with that racket but if you would watch the breathing signature they would use that opportunity to recalibrate instead of become anxious and so being able to reset it when we when we train athletes with battling ropes we know that it's going to smoke you the 30 seconds between sets is what I'm looking at because I want to see who's actually down regulating their system and recovering better before the next bout. And so, so many people assign the stress of an exercise set and don't compact and compress the recovery with the same amount of coaching. And I think that's, that's a really good observation. So uh, speed, elasticity, and breathing <laughs> probably have a lot more to do with longevity than the size of your biceps or uh, what your VO2 max says at any given stress test. And what you uh, observe there watching those great players is a timing that they introduced at what you would call a a pre-action routine. So the fiddling around with the strings is getting them ready in a timing way to get ready to implement the breathing that goes into a pattern before they eventually get. So if you watched a video of four hours and watch Jack Nicklaus play a round of golf, you would find as he walks to address a ball on a green, he lines the ball up. He would go, you'd almost find the same timing in terms of when he actually released the putt and he would do the same thing with his breathing as he came and he calmed down before. So it's all a system that very, very good sportsmen don't allow tension to break that routine. And um, and that's one of the, the the great tricks that people don't understand about pros is the is them understanding uh, the key things that are important and and making them part of a pre-action routine every time. You watch Michael Jordan. If you watched enough of him, I'm sure he would have exactly the same routine when he before he took a shot, preparing himself and moving, and and and, and his breathing would have been part of that as well. Yes, yes, they, and I guess. In many situations, that's the only thing you can control. And if you don't know how to do it, then you've lost that yeah. opportunity as well. So, yeah. Peter, you, you had 20 years. And during those 20 years, I'm assuming you, you had to deal with some injuries. And I know that's kind of, again, kind of the world that we're in. But, you know, and just maybe briefly kind of give us an idea. Because, you know, those injuries, how much did that lead you to kind of embrace our philosophy? Because obviously, you know, we've gotten to know you well. You're kind of, uh, you know, you've taken our philosophy and implemented it into, into the youth and physical education, which I want to get into. But talk, talk to us how you had to deal with injuries, um, because we talk about breathing, reaction time, the neurological. I think the neurological aspect of, of what you're talking about when we get to movement. Um, but, but how did you navigate that throughout your career? Well, I, I think back uh, my journey to, to kind of getting what you guys do started uh, a, week, a week before my 19th birthday. I was playing in a rugby match and I went to kick a rugby ball in the middle of a match and I got tackled. And basically what happened is the person who tackled me as I was kicking this rugby ball, like a punter in a game of um, American football, the uh, tackler came in and he missed the ball and he took my knee out. And uh, so I did my anterior cruciate. That was done. But what it did is it, um, and I didn't realize at the time, but it, uh, snapped uh, or tore or extended my perineal nerve uh, down the right side of my um, knee down to my big toe and I got foot drop. Oh, wow. So I had a hundred percent foot drop, which um, basically for the next four months until I had an operation, uh, well, I never recovered from it. So I've got probably 85% foot drop in my right foot. Wow. And Peter, just, so, just so everybody understands that, what that means is you couldn't lift your foot up, right? No, you I literally could not, could not dorsiflex or, or lift your foot up. I can't, I can't dorsiflex now. <laughs> oh, my so, goodness. Um, wow. I limp, I, um, I, I, so my sporting career was over in that moment, and um, I had to sit for two years uh, trying to work out whether I, would, whether I wanted to play sport again at all uh, c- c- clearly rugby was not going to be a sport for me anymore and i wondered whether i could get back into cricket either, at least socially and um so i just wrapped my ankle up in a huge figure of eight and got a few dorsiflex 
braces and I started playing again. And, and then I realized I could no longer concentrate. I had no balance anymore. It seemed to affect the way I concentrated. And it took me another year to find, you imagine in golf, you know how golfers swing into their right leg, you know, right-handed golfers, and then they transfer and then across back to the front foot. Mm -hmm. um, but you, got, you, you had this um, front foot tilt golf thing came in about 15 years ago where everyone just got on their front foot when they played golf. Well, I had to kind of become a, a stack and tilt cricketer. Okay. On, and, and play on my left leg in effect and leave my right leg dorsiflexion behind me. And, um, so it was, um, it, it was a, certainly a learning experience. And then I really started learning about movement. Well, from, if we'd been your physical therapist, if I'd been your physical therapist and he'd been your athletic trainer and we'd seen you at 19 and somebody said, forecast this guy's ability to play pro sports, we'd have both probably said, it's no way it's going to happen. So the fact that you did that tells me that you you figured out the compensation that was necessary. And secondly, your resources in hand-eye coordination must be off the charts if even on a faulty base you could accomplish what you did. So, Yeah, so look, I, I, I did, and, and I think they – got to say, the, I just love playing so much. It's a great motivator when you're a young person that you enjoy doing what you're doing. I, I found learning a new way to do it very, very challenging – and I found a way to do it, and I started being successful again. And then within about six months, I said, no, I'm going to try and be pro. I'm going to try and get pro. And, <laughs> well, I'm glad um, we didn't tell you you couldn't. Because <laughs> no, you'd have proved this wrong, um, and we probably would have. What, what, it, what it did to me physically, guys, and this is the, the bit, it completely destroyed my gait. It wrecked my lower back. So my whole last 10 years of my cricket career are all about my lower back operations, um, uh, what it's done to me physically to try with this faulty gait to, to do what I've had to do physically to be fit enough and to train and to do all that sort of stuff has destroyed my body in a way. Happy to have spent those cards because I've done what I wanted to do for 20 years and that's life and it's got to get on with it. Um, but uh, it, it, I learned so much about my body and about movement and actually – what I, the biggest lesson I learned is, um, and this is when I first connected with you guys, is something I read that you'd written, Gray, about um, a, an analogy of the body being the body's the hardware and your software is your brain. And the fact that actually, if you read enough into great sportsmen, they understand that key. The key is you can change movement with your thoughts and I don't want to get too complicated here, but you read lots of books that says you have to do 10,000 repetitions of something to embed a movement. Yes. Not true. You can imagine how you want to do it, and within a couple of weeks of imagining it, your body can do it because your body doesn't know whether you're doing it or you're imagining it. Okay? So there is a hack that you learn that Jack Nicholas learned. You read any of his books, he talks about playing a video in his head all the time of all the shots he played and what he's talking about is playing the game of golf in the six inches between your ears and training your body to move with a, a stimulus that is actually made up in your head. And when you realize that you can hack movement with your subconscious, you realize that actually it's not hard to go back and hack movement patterns that already exist. No, you, 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 you articulated that perfectly. And by making that statement, you also create a space where the opposite of that statement is true. You can also kill your movement between your ears. And I'm not just talking about being discouraged or anything like that. You can have a fixed habitual way of doing things that is creating a hardware problem. And us just de-inflaming the hardware doesn't change the faulty motor program. And so uh, a lot of people in the States have seen me do the toe touch progression on stage, uh, take somebody from the audience that hasn't touched their toes. And in a matter of moments, I have them touching their toes. But the, the irony was all I did was put them into a slot where they had to behave differently. 
that different behavior caused them to fire different muscles at different times. So the tightness that they thought they were perceiving when they tried to touch their toes was nothing but an inappropriate tone in their hamstrings because they were too far forward and it was keeping them from crashing on top of their head. And so I just set them back on their heels and said, now try to do it. It was impossible the old way that they thought was the only way they created a new path. It's really easy for somebody to default back to those bad habits, but I think you open up a space for if you can correct your movement patterns or refine and polish them between your ears, you can also get them pretty rusty right between your ears. Well, so. that's the problem. Most The average person doesn't, doesn't even consider that possibility. The, the elite athlete it's innate. It's just built in. They just, they just do it without having to think about it, in, in my opinion. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you've heard us talk about the power of the functional movement screen. It can forever change the way you work with athletes and clients. Sign up for our FMS live virtual course and become FMS certified from the comfort of your own home or office. You will be guided by a live instructor through the entire process. With the ability to ask our team questions in real time and watch instructors work with live models throughout the day. You'll finish the course with the ability to start implementing the FMS into your own practice. And for a limited time, we'd like to offer our podcast listeners a special discount. Follow the link in the show notes and use promo code VERT22 at checkout for $50 off virtual FMS Level 1 or Level 2 certification courses. That's V-I-R-T-2-2. And if you bundle them at checkout, you'll save an additional $120 automatically. We look forward to you joining us. Now back to the show. That idea that, you know, you can manipulate and, and think about movement differently within your, you know, your neurological system. I mean, you identified, and, and we've been talking about this for years, how can we improve, how can we take that concept and apply it to what we know is a problem now? And that's in the youth space with all these kids and all the youth not being able to, to move on. That's really what brought you, what, what created our relationship, right? Yeah, well, look, per personally, um, you know, I took what I had learned. I connected very much with what I saw that you guys were doing. It was almost like a light. I'd never seen anybody discuss it like you guys had discussed it. You know, when you're talk, you know, you're, people think about movement as being physical, not neurological. And, and, and to see people out there like you guys actually who get it was very interesting. I mean, I lived it, but you guys actually get it. Um, my um my third child matthew who's 19 now um yeah, M matthew's mildly autistic and so uh shame on me um during his um school years early school years we concentrated so hard on social interaction interaction and language i i really ignored his body and when he got to his early teenage years he hadn't put on a, a pe kit and he i hadn't actually seen him run and, and 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 his postures were terrible and his general his general physical makeup I looked and I thought goodness me I've got to start looking at ways to go back and re relook at the what's going on here uh, and and really um also you know seeing what you guys did and seeing how easy it is once you understand let me give you a good example okay. Matthew I used to throw um, a tennis ball at him in the backyard and he would he couldn't catch it and and he didn't seem to be able to even see the tennis ball. Yet he would take that tennis ball and out of frustration, lie on his bed at night and throw it up to the ceiling and catch it one handed. And I couldn't understand how he could catch the ball so easily one handed in his bedroom. And yet the next day he couldn't catch it in the backyard until I realized that when he got on two feet, he was so challenged from a vestibular point of view. He had no resources left to concentrate on the tennis ball. So his starting ball wasn't a gross development skill of catching. It was single wobble boards, trampoline, single leg balance. We had to build a whole foundation underneath gross development skills to help him bridge up into gross development skills. And when I finally got that, I understand what's running in education at the moment. Everything's based around gross development skills, but gross development skills are sometimes very complex and the kids don't have the base fundamentals underneath because they've had a lack of vestibular development. 
to do the gross development skills. You get these poor coaches, well-meaning coaches in, in schools who try to teach kids how to hit a tennis ball or to throw. And actually, if they look close, that child can't skip. And if they look even closer, that child can't balance on one leg and the other. And so then we have movement patterns and we have um, the neurodevelopmental sequence that they all went through and where we need to go back and fill that layer up of base vestibular development to help us then with gross development. And that's where you guys are. Nobody else's position there. And hence, I flew to Boston. I said, look, I think what you guys do is amazing. I haven't seen anybody talking about this. If we could devise a software platform, we could give very simple information to schools and put it into a system they could deliver to hundreds and hundreds and thousands of students. However simple it is, it would be profound. And that's really what we're trying to do. And we're having great success. And, and thank you to for you guys for getting involved four years ago and helping us do that. And, and one thing I want to make sure our listeners know is that FMS easily can produce exercises and programming. But that doesn't matter to me as much as the fact that we didn't even start this journey without at least attempting to set a standard. When we learn math, when we learn sentence structure and communication through the written word, when we learn science or social studies, there is a standard of learning. And you don't just read the book and regurgitate it. In math class, you've got to run the calculations, right? In, in geometry class, you've got to work with a quadrilateral triangle and know the formulas that make that work. The standards of learning right now in our state of Virginia for PE are amazing. They talk about motor control, biomechanics, caloric expenditure for activities. But children read the rules, memorize them. There is no standard of learning that if you can apply this or not, and so the movement screen sets a standard of learning. And, and I always envisioned if I struggle in algebra and I get better with the equations and get better with algebra, and at the end of the semester, I now am competent in algebra, I can demonstrate that through problem solving. If I have a gross asymmetry and can't balance on my left leg and there's no medical reason for it, it's just one of those wonky things that happens in growth and development, my PE class this year should be closing that gap, meaning making myself physically competent. So to me, the grading scale that we have, A through F, uh, Ds and Fs are risk factors, meaning if, if I make Ds and Fs in math, somebody's going to take advantage of me in the next calculation <laughs> endeavor I go into in real life. So making me safe in math is actually protecting my future. Removing risk factors should be the first order of business in physical education. And it's almost like I think most physical educators right now are anxious to show us sports and opportunities at physical activity. But that's like trying to make somebody excited about reading that hasn't even got phonics down yet. And that's what you're saying. We got to go back and we can't assume phonics anymore. We can't assume the fundamentals of reading are in people anymore. And so if we run these... I can easily find a class full of kids that have very poor balance and mobility and still create an obstacle course that makes them feel like they're a ninja warrior. And that's the whole point. If we meet them where they are, they are so plastic that we can grow them right back into that slot that would demonstrate competency. But we cannot assume physical competency in any population on any platform anymore. And without a standard... Everybody thinks they're doing a good job. Well, well great. That, that's the problem. And I think, Peter, that's what you, when you started engaging some of these um, educational institutions, that's kind of what I've heard you say as well is you can't make, you know, a lot of these educators have made the assumption once the children get to a certain level, middle schoolers, for the example, they assume they have the fundamentals. They assume they can balance. They assume they can do these things. They assume they can skip and all those things and not realize that they can't and they don't know what to do. And I think that's where you've kind of uh, um, witnessed as well, correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the exciting thing for us is um, in education, you know, we've, we've literally – spoken to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of schools around the world and and all these wonderful teachers they're all on it they all see it their their acuity is telling them what's in front of them 
And as Grace says, they have no way of measuring it, but they know what they see. And they'd like to get an individual profile on a child just to know exactly what that is, not to compare him against another child or another girl, just to get a starting point that they could work from to be able to objectively show some improvement. I'll give you one, two examples. A, the child who can't throw, can't skip, can't balance is also a child who probably can't pull themselves out of a swimming pool and can't do a push-up properly. Yet, if you teach that child to diaphragmatically breathe properly, it might only take you a couple of days, and that child learns to use their core again and connect it to the push-up, and they can suddenly do a push-up again. Now, the fire that lights under that child to suddenly be able to do a push-up they thought that they couldn't do, to suddenly be able to pull themselves out of a swimming pool and the anxiety they don't have when they're swimming now, that they can jump in and pull themselves out, changes their whole athletic profile and their whole mind is flipped in terms of the possibilities. And all you've done is teach that child how to diaphragmatically breathe. Mm -hmm. The child who screens poorly on the shoulder mobility screen, poor ones, you change them to good twos and that can happen in a couple of days their gait has changed, their profiles changed, their shoulders changed, the athletic potential that child has now for the next 50 years has completely changed. And the teachers, when they see that happen in front of their eyes and can measure the poor ones and then the excellent twos two weeks later, it's a very exciting thing. And when they see that child able to sit up straight in class instead of on their elbow trying to find balance and that child's handwriting has the ability to improve because of their posture at, at the table, then they realize the child is an athlete. Every child, whether they play sport or not, doesn't matter. They're athletes for life. And we've got to start thinking of them in PE in schools as athletes for life, not potential sports people. Sports are the icing on the cake. It's great. Everyone loves that. Competitiveness, you know, I was, uh, I, I, I loved it. But it's not for everybody. But it doesn't mean it. Not we don't have to think about everybody's bodies. That that is an observation that that I think a lot of people become teachers and coaches and especially PE teachers. Uh, not because of how the job pays. We all know that these people could probably pull a, a little bit higher income somewhere else. But I think the the thing you get bit with in in coaching and and athletic development and teaching and physical education is the transformation you just talked about. Otherwise, it's just a transaction. Here's the material, memorize it, regurgitate it tomorrow. That's not what teaching's about. The people who are in there for life love those transformational opportunities, and there's never been a greater time because there are greater needs. I'm going to read you one statistic right now. 60% uh, of the youth in the United States have a uh, cardiorespiratory fitness problem. We also know that's a risk factor for a musculoskeletal injury as well. So just by demonstrating that the majority of kids, 60%, already have a cardiorespiratory fitness deficiency, dysfunction, not only are they in line for the cardiovascular series of metabolic diseases, Western diseases, they already have one box checked saying there's a greater than average chance there's also a musculoskeletal risk factor like ankle mobility or serious balance asymmetry or the complete neglect of a movement pattern existing in this child, and we haven't even checked it yet. The fact that your cardio is down tells us that your movement nutrient is deficient. There's no reason why it wouldn't leave both a musculoskeletal deficiency in you and a cardiorespiratory. And what do we tell the kids that have not had an active life and they're carrying a little extra weight? They're getting ready to have a physical image of their self that they don't think can change. And we both know that anytime you're found to come out of a tunnel and you find yourself a little bit heavy or, or awkward, well, you got to eat right and exercise. These people already have risk factors for exercise. So a lot of these PE teachers can't drop the lesson plan they used to because the majority of your kids in the room have risk factors and they're not all the same risk factors. Some are going to get shin splints and have low back pain at a very minimal level of activity, and as soon as you've created a problem, they're on the bleachers. Now that now it's worse than ever because every time they get physical, they get bit. 
and they're getting bit by something that doesn't have to be there if we just remove it. Well, so part of what you're describing, Peter, is too often when you when you go into a PE class, you get the the kids who are you know the athletes, so to speak, who are really good at running, really good at playing sports, really good at playing basketball, football, and then you get the individuals who who aren't good, who get very discouraged, and they're sitting on the sides, kind of watching, or just. You may be going through the motions. That that's kind of the way it hears in the, in the states, especially once you get to middle school. Is you've already segmented out during PE class the kids who it just comes easy to them and the kids who have problems. Whereas what you're describing, those kids who normally are getting discouraged and have problems, you're almost leveling the playing field. Because I would argue a lot of those kids who it's just natural are going to have still some difficulties doing some of these basic fundamentals. And the kids who may have problems playing a sport, basketball, football, whatever it is, when you come in and you start implementing these fundamentals, that's going to quickly enhance their ability to maybe do something else. Yeah, I'll give you one example. I, I remember we did some screening in a school and I hung around in the afternoon. They did some capacity testing. And one of the capacity tests was a standing broad jump. And I saw a little uh, 16-year-old girl do the most amazing standing broad jump. And she was an England under 16 netballer, an incredible athlete. And uh, I, she must have jumped six or seven feet. It was incredible. <laughs> and the little girl behind her in the line, uh, we'd screened that little girl earlier on, physically didn't look a lot different, but she had screened terribly. And she barely could jump a foot and a half. She had no confidence to... She had no coordination, no confidence to land, let alone to jump. And I looked at that and you looked at the school and it was a huge school and it was a huge private school. And I'd have to say they had millions of pounds invested in turning the seven foot broad jump into seven foot two. Yet if they had, they turned some of those resources in turning the foot and a half broad jump into three feet, the three feet broad jump would still be rubbish from a sports point of view, but the fire would light under that little girl in terms of the possibilities for her athleticism going on and for her to want to start investigating what was possible with her body. So we're starting to engage her neurology starting to engage her software she's starting to think hold on a second what can I do with this hardware I can change it then actually you're telling the story of the 80 percent below the 20 percent that's involved in sport you're talking about fundamentals vestibular uh, development gross uh, motor skill development that's not about sport it's about life it's about connecting everybody with what's possible. So if we could turn that little girl with no confidence into a social runner, then we'd done a wonderful thing for her in her family and for, for going on. And that's what I think schools and education are going to have to be all about because Gray's stats there in youth in America are completely reflected in the NHS in the UK um, something like 50% of the resources used in the NHS are for musculoskeletal pain and another 20% from the, the mental and anxiety issues and mental health issues involved with that pain. And it all starts when they're four years of age and they go to school and start sitting all day. Yeah. And that's where it starts. And we have to completely restructure the way we look at movement, the way we look at health, um, sure diets, a huge part of it, but actually just as big a part of it is how we move and how we encourage movement at a very young age. And and that's why we think we can make a huge difference um, by not looking at it from a sports point of view. Sure, there's sports out there where you need to be three stone heavier than a normal male. Mm -hmm. We get that, right? You can't compete in that sport unless you're that animal. And there's a whole industry devised about turning – uh, athletes into that bigger animal for that sport. But that's actually, that's not true of the everyday human being. And we don't need it. And, you know, um, there's, there's a majority of Nobel Peace Prize winners in the science fields, but most of them have what I would consider a little above average physical life 
and a greater appreciation for the arts. We argue all the time that an appreciation for the arts doesn't mean you have to become a professional dancer, musician, sculptor, painter. It means that it brings about that aesthetic awareness that is going to matter to you sometime in your life. And I would argue your physical competency has nothing to do with you becoming an athlete. And, and when my wife and I volunteered for three years at a local school that had no formal PE program, the teachers had access to the gym for a period of day, but the same teacher that was your homeroom teacher just allowed you to have runabout or whatever you wanted to do that day. Danielle and I showed up with a lot of the Perform Better equipment balance beams, boxes to climb onto, bags to drag, and battling ropes. The one girl you talked about with the foot, uh, one foot uh, standing long jump, the, the hack we found to make the transformation is we'd get one of those battling ropes and just do a big old wave because the mechanics it takes to load your hips to make that wave go for a, a good distance and a heavy rope is the exact same mechanic it takes to jump. And it looks completely different in the action we're doing. But you take somebody who has all these disconnects in their jumping power and you get them to put a wave on a battling rope and then turn around and jump again, but say, don't think about it, just do it. And before you know it, they will double their effort. And I see it very often in very fit runners who run on flat surfaces or treadmills, they completely lose that hip power signature. They're still good runners. They're doing their 5Ks and stuff like that, but they completely lose that squat, jump, broad jump drive, and we can reinstall it in a matter of seconds. And the one thing they say is, well, how do I maintain that? And I'm like, pick something that uses your hips more than running. A little bit of kettlebell swings, battling ropes, just do one other thing. Don't be myopic in your, your exposure. But it's so neat to, to just expose somebody to that physical slice of life and say, go grab yours. It'll balance you out. Just, you know, that physical expression is just like that artistic expression. It actually makes you better in the thing you do. Otherwise, those Nobel Peace Prize winners would be a very myopic, focused, scientific geek, not this balanced human that can dump tension and energy and expression in other avenues other than their vocation. So, so Peter, I, I've got a, a common, a common probably question you get, and I've got it a lot. I'm sure Gray's got it a lot over the years. Is how do you do this? How do you take? you know, the FMS, if you will. And, and I know a lot of our listeners know what the movement screen is and they know, you know, it takes 10 minutes to do it and it's pretty easy to do it one-on-one, -on -one, but how do you put this into a school system? And I'll give you my example as, you know, probably going back 15 years ago, my wife teaches first grade and I'm ambitious. I go in and try to teach, you know, take the first graders through a movement screen. And for the, you know, I had a bunch of my students over there and we went in and we screened them and for the good hour class where we screened all those 20 kids, they beat the hell out of me for, for a good 45 minutes trying to take them through a movement screen. So I think the assumption is, and again, I know there's a lot of you know, people listening say, hey, how do we do this in our area or how do we do this in our school? And what you learned also, Peter, and kind of walk us through this, this you know, process for you is it's, you, you're not necessarily going to go in and do a full functional movement screen, the traditional movement screen in a school. What you've learned is how to tweak it, but how to tweak it in a way that it works in a school system. So, so let us know, kind of give us that, that process, that you know, journey you went through of where that you, had, you were trying to do the traditional, get the teachers to do the screen, and, and to where you are now that you've got a system and you have talked to a lot of schools. You've got quite a few schools actually implementing it and having success. Well, you know, when I did the FMS qualification myself, I actually – was really surprised how complicated it was and it, there was quite a there was a lot to it and and of course your therapists your 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 background is therapist you and and somebody qualifies in the fms they want to have a really thorough look at their client and the way that they're moving the body but of course in schools where we're literally talking about hundreds and hundreds and thousands of children that we've got to get try and get a little profile of them quickly and they, teachers don't have time to do a full screen. So what we, you know, as you know, we came to you three years ago, two and a half years ago, um, and said, look, we, we've got to make this a little bit simpler, a little bit easier, adapt the screen. And what came out of it is something we call the movement pattern screen for schools. And we also, um, which is a slightly 
non-equipment based you just need lines on the floor and lines on the wall way of assessing movement and getting a simple some simple data points um, and and then what we do is if a child has a shoulder mobility issue in the progression we let the teachers go back and just screen for the shoulder mobility issue that they're working on and then move them on in the program rather than having to do a full screen so we don't make the screen central to everything it's more the the movement therapy and the work that we have the schools doing all the time. So we're trying to introduce all the correctives and the motor correctives into warm up and warm downs before PE and sport. So the children are doing them all the time and learning how to get the shoulder postures correct and then keeping them there and working on their hips. Because it's after we've got a simple data set on a child that we, we know where we've got to start, it's really the doing that's important rather than the, than the checking. All the, all the time. And so we're, um, we're more hands on that way. Um, but at the other end, with our schools, we've got that 20% of the sports athletes in our schools, and they're always injured, like athletes are. Uh, they're going through growth spurts, and they have to be rescreened because their the patterns of movement get all over the place. So it's interesting from our child who can't do a, a, a one and a half foot standing broad jump, to your national athlete at 17 in a school, uh, they all use the screening system uh, to their benefit in different ways. So you know we're you know so we're um, we're, we're delighted with that because uh, at one end, the sports and conditioning team within the schools are using the FMS in more a traditional athletic um, sports way, and then at the bottom we we're using it for our children who have gross development issues, identifying them and repatterning some of their basic patterns at the bottom end, and then everybody in between. So uh, the answer to your question, um, really, Lee, is at one end, we've tried to make it as simple and easy as possible to get some simple objective data without getting too caught up uh, in in um, in it and, and giving the, the teachers the ability to just make some simple improvements that they can see for their own eyes. No, I think that's a that's a good statement, and in 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 the early part of movement screening, to just get some reliability, intern inter rate of reliability, and make sure we had a valid test. Lee and I had to be very specific in the way you take movement screen data in, and and that was just trying to uphold a standard. Now that we know the fundamental bottlenecks that can be under four layers of bad fitness. Any way you can get that movement weakest link, that ankle mobility to surface so we can do something about it, that kid with scoliosis that showed up in a rotation T-spine, shoulder mobility, whatever, it doesn't matter how we get these fundamental dysfunctions to surface. If we screen everybody formally like we do with the NFL Combine, or if in a four-week class we get all the movement patterns covered. It doesn't matter as long as the end result is you found a movement competency issue in somebody. And just like you said, I think a lot of the kids in PE just have a fundamental lack of activity. So generally, all their fundamental patterns are poor. In athletics, you know what we find? Five superior movement patterns and two dysfunctional ones, meaning the sport has really fed and maintained lunging and single leg stance, but it's totally crashed their, you know, off feet core control in their deep squat. So, you know, the athletes lose one fundamental and it causes a train wreck, you know, later on. These kids just have had a uh, insufficient diet of activity. So all the patterns are equally eroded sometimes, but the formality of the test helped us get a standard. The way you choose to make a movement difference might have to be in a in a fragmented testing environment, or let's get the baseline today and chip away at it. Both work, and and I think you've demonstrated that one's just going to well, work better in some environments than the other. Well, look, we think you've done the hard. You know, we're 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 in effect producing a a, a resource. And we're standing on your shoulders and the work that you guys have done for 15 years, all around re reliability and, and 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 the testing that you've done. We've taken a view that if we waste our time trying to create a scientific study around tens of thousands of children for the next five years, we're not going to get anything done. What I know is if we get two children 
that the screen we've devised will tell us something about that individual and where they are at that point in time that will help us move them forward. We're not looking to compare the two children. We're looking to find a starting point for each child and improve each child somewhere different. And if we take that view, rather than trying to create data around thousands of children and cross refer them and in and out of different sports, then we're going to save ourselves a lot of angst and a lot of tr trouble. So we look at it very much. We just want to know about you, what might be holding you back, what we might be able to do to change your data set that's going to help you. And that's all we focus on. No, so I'm sorry, Greg. One, one question I got, Peter, and we, we've already we've talked about this a little, but I'm going to specifically ask you this question: What has what have you observed in because you you've said it, you've worked with a lot of schools now. I think it's up to thirty to 50, maybe fifty schools, and and spoken to hundreds of schools um, across the world, all over the world at this point. Two questions I got: One, what has surprised you the most? And two, what have you seen occur in the schools that are implementing this? What are some of the positives? Not, you, know, you know, you just say you're not literally looking at the data, but in a way you are. What, what are some of the positive impacts? So what has surprised you about in talking to some of these schools? And we've talked about it a little bit, so that's one question. And two, what has been the biggest positive you've seen come out of the schools that are implementing what you're doing? Well, what, what I've, um, what, one, one thing I've learned, is that often cliches are very, very true. That's why they're cliches. And one cliche I've learned is the more you put in, the more you get out. And schools who have implemented what we do, the exciting results that they see in front of their eyes are sometimes instantaneous. I'll give you the example about learning to children to breathe on their noses again and, and to, to get their diaphragms working again and, and, and engage with their cause. You know, they, um, you, you hear teachers coming back about the change in a child's posture in a matter of two days. Uh, a teenage girl uh, who they think has great flexibility when they do their SLR, yet she can't touch her knees, yet can suddenly, once they realize it's her postural control is out, and as Grace said, the moment she leans forward, her neurology tells her that she's falling over, so she tightens her hamstrings up. As The moment you hack and change that neurology and she learns how to do it and believes she can do it, suddenly that child can touch their toes again, It's a, and it's instantaneous. And the, the thing, these little neurological hacks, people are under this impression we're all physically trapped. Children are just a collection of neurological limps. They're just bad habits they've built up, and you can rehack them really easily. You can change ranges of motion, postural control, strength, have them doing different things really, really quickly. And the difference in that child's neurology and their perception of what they can do is the really exciting thing we have coming back from schools. Uh, we were very lucky this year. One of our initial schools won the Independent School of the Year Award uh, for the Movement Pattern Program. Oh, okay? wow. So wow. your adapted screen, which is now the Movement Pattern screen in schools, won out over all the huge, the largest independent schools in the UK, Epsom College, Shed Beer, Eton, all of these uh, colleges, a little prep school. And their data changed in three months 90% of the school. Now, that school's only 170 students. The teachers in the school get screened. The teachers will give their students a break in double maths to do their breathing exercises and maybe their shoulder mobility. The whole skill bought into it. And the, the changes that they say are incredible. And, and, and we're getting that feedback all the time, uh, anecdotal feedback. But one of the best stories I've heard is from a school that we've signed and the director of school, school of, that, um, of that school was so keen to sign us up and have us because he is FMS qualified. He'd went off and got FMS qualified 10 years ago and he used your screening and your correctives for what we would call Senko children. So special needs children with movement issues and problems and behavioral issues. Okay. And over his 10 years, through his own initiative, 
the changes he was able to, to, to bring to some of those children. Uh, but unfortunately, as he said, only very few because he couldn't he couldn't deliver it to everybody. But the changes he was, a, a, you know, children's concentration. So I'll give you an example, Gray. I saw that great work you did with Danielle. So you, we have pre-prep in the UK, three to seven-year-olds. If you look at the three-year-olds sat cross-legged, straight backs, cross-armed, breathing through their noses at the front of the assembly, sit there for 20 minutes. You look at the six-year-olds at the back of the assembly, they can't sit cross-legged for 20 minutes. And the behavior issues are at the back of the class with the six-year-olds who can't sit properly. You see the same thing in classrooms. What they know now is movement is deteriorating in classrooms, but so is behavior. Yes. And it's children's bodies and children's lack of comfort and ability to balance properly affects their concentration abilities, their ability to write neatly. Children will look for balance in everything they do. Watch them queuing for lunch. They'll, If they don't have postural control, they'll lean to one side. Children, you go into a class. If they're not physically developed, they'll all be on their elbows. You watch a child who plays an instrument and has to breathe playing that instrument. You'll find that that child will have good posture and be able to sit properly in class. So the human athlete yeah, is one system and it's all connected and their brains are connected just like a pro athlete is connected with their brains. And we have to start realizing our young people, their body is the key to their success in life. And, uh, and we've, we've, it's going to have to become part of PE in, in schools in the future. And, and what you guys do, your connection to movement and neurology is going to become the core of PE in the future. Well, no, I, I appreciate that. And and I'm going to challenge you and Lee right now. I, I thought of two pearls as you were talking that I don't know if I've ever put together for our listeners. This applies to physical education, applies to clinical practice, it applies to strength conditioning athletes. But the, the, the first pearl with kids is if you go out and screen kids, it'll look like a lot of kids are tight. They have mobility problems. Think this through. What you're seeing is an appropriate tone. They haven't been on the planet long enough to, to create these fascial knots and trigger points and post injuries that leave joints sort of riddled and, and stiff. If you see a kid that shows inflexible or stiff, assume it's an appropriate tone. And now ask yourself a question. If I hadn't have said that, were you getting ready to assign a stretch? Because they don't need to stretch. They need to move with better balance and integrity. And the second thing you said is Lee and I actually dipped our toe in the water with a school and special needs kids a long, long time ago. And the one thing that screening those kids told us is I said, whatever movement pattern is their greatest dilemma, give them some obstacles at that level just to sort of engage that pattern. But in every instance, look for opportunities to cross the midline. In so many of these behavior and focus disorders, we see the left and right hemisphere wanting to do two different things. And anytime you cross the midline in movement, you actually re-weld the brain together. Your creative brain and your analytical brain and the two halves of your brain that move the whole of your body need to be playing at the same rhythm and the same beat so they can both process and exchange information across that corpus callosum, that connection. And when you cross the midline with your arms and legs, and when you change your posture from vertical to horizontal and everything in between, you basically light up those neurons on both sides and create a little bit of harmony that normal adolescence and normal education cause you to get fixed in one side of your brain or the other. And if you look at the, the most beautiful dance moves in the world, have a lot of crosses of the midline. You look at Indian clubs, you look at crawling on a balance beam, you look at walking on a balance beam, they're all crossing the midline. Throwing and swinging crosses the midline. And so the two things I want people to understand is don't see stiff kids as tight. They're running an inappropriate tone and give them opportunities to cross the midline. And when you see a bad pattern, take them down a level. Don't instruct them or coach them at that pattern. Just take them down a level or to something less complex 
bring them back up. When they're down there, make them move and make them cross the midline and bring them back up. You see miracles happen. I think they um, got any pearls that, that that we could throw out there because I want people to hear this. Kids aren't tight. They're inappropriately well, let me, toned. Let, so. let me, let, let me just uh, say some of the work you were doing with Danielle uh, look, look like to me, like you were letting children experiment and play with their movement. So I would say at a very young age, the first screen that children have is play. And they do that in every species. Watch how animals learn how to move. They play, they wrestle, they dive on each other. They, they experiment with movement. And really the first screen for little ones is, is they got to learn through experimenting. So you give them an environment that's safe, that they can make mistakes and try it again and make another mistake and learn and grow and cross the middle line and those things. And that's probably where we look at society now and how we have, how it's changed without us noticing. Um, now we, instead of letting a baby crawl around in a safe, soft area, we hang them up from the kitchen door and we watch them standing like we think it's some progress they're making and they're not learning anything. They're just passing time watching mum cook when actually they need to be on their own, standing up, falling over, standing up, falling over in baby gym. And that's how we used to learn 40,000 years ago. We used to fall over in the dust and get up and dust ourselves off and, and go again. And those environments were not. Um, so what, what you're saying uh, is 100 uh, percent true. Great. It gets to a point, unfortunately, when you get 14 year old uh, kids that it's not cool to play anymore and they don't want to do silly things and, and, and stuff. So we have to be a little bit re more regimented with our patterns, but at least they can follow instruction and do things. But certainly the age group you're talking about, uh, less screening, uh, less correctives, uh, play, um, experiment, and, uh, and, and I do, I think that's probably, you're quite right. Play is the first screen. Watch them play. And you'll, you'll learn a lot about a, a child doing that. Well, the, the point of screening is to check your confidence against your reality. If it's a self-gauging, I think that, that all of us who manage ourselves physically at a pretty good homeostasis are pretty self-aware. Well, when we got a young puppy at home right now, he has about 32 crashes a day. It's not an emotional experience. He doesn't embrace failure as anything. And if you watch children fall, it's not emotional. I mean, if they hurt their self, it is, but they have absolutely no negative connotation with failure. And that's the way Danielle and I tried to set up this, this obstacle course. I'm like, go as fast as you can on the balance beam without falling. And the fastest kids fell more than the, the slowest kids because they were so concerned with speed that they let their quality go. So we're basically, we're checking both ends of it. And we never really had this is pass or this is failure. We'd set up these little obstacle courses and obviously we want them to compete. They're both going. But the cool thing, it, the, the last five minutes of every class, they had patterned each other. We already knew who was the best one at today's obstacle. But I said, okay, if you didn't do as good as you wanted to do, what can you do between now and next class? Because the one thing, we only have one class a week, but we left the equipment in the gym for recess. Kids that didn't show well on the balance beam last Thursday, they just, uh, they were on that balance beam. And the very next week, it fixed itself. I didn't issue a program. I didn't issue homework. The natural competitive spirit and peer pressure worked in the positive direction. They, they literally patterned each other. So as long as I had a good bell curve in the class, everybody knew who to watch. And they learned more from watching the kid that was getting over the box with a, an elbow hook technique. And all of a sudden, everybody's doing it. And, and it was a really, Danielle and I, over the three-year period, the one thing we learned is to shut up. We, we spent more time developing the obstacles than we did coaching how to overcome the obstacle. Because if you set it up right, um, it just happens. You just turn movement loose. And, and all we did was create some lanes and those lanes actually refine the movement better than my monologue would have. And I, I think I, I want coaches to hear that because I needed to hear that. I even was doing it with less words in the third year than I did it in the first year. 
And Peter, that's one thing you, you guys are working on now is, is developing that part of the curriculum where it is getting that, that three to seven year old group where you're not necessarily going to screen them, but you're going to try to give them some opportunities to just to explore, to move, to play in, in a safe environment. Yeah, we're, we're developing a new model we're going to call mini movement. And really what we want to do is we want to introduce all the patterns and, and movement and um, cross-coordination and crossing the center line into simple little videos and instructional things for young prep, pre-prep teachers to be able to watch and learn and, and create their own games. Uh, we don't we don't want children being stressed. We want them to have fun. We want them to be able to make mistakes, make it up their own way. Because I wouldn't, getting back to neurology, uh, wouldn't underestimate the importance. You get a child who can't can't crawl in a coordinated way. They know, they know there's something that they can't do right. And if you can help a child discover that coordination and cross the center line coordination, the difference that you make to that children's perception of what they can do sets them off on a different track. So very, very simple things, yeah, are massively important. It's the little analogy of the foot and a half broad jump, long jump, standing Mm -hmm. broad jump. Just that little bit of something that allows them to go an extra step can be just all that's needed neurologically in a child. You know, the first time they touch their toes and they go, wow, I can do this. Um, That's what we're looking for different children to just feel and have. And um, everything that we do is is heading in that direction. But you can't start, you know, I saw one thing Gray did about teaching children. How, How do you teach a child to run fast? Well, they've got to learn how to stop first. <laughs> yes. Because if if they don't have the confidence to stop, they're not going to let themselves run. So and how we, do you teach we have them found to that, stop? Yeah, we found that is one of the big things in poor jumping. It's not that they don't have three foot worth of power. They only feel comfortable landing after being in the air for a foot. So it is the landing that preloads the, um, how can I say, the governored or inhibited effort is I don't feel comfortable landing any further than a foot and a half. So that's how far I jump. And so my analogy, remember my analogy with Matthew and, and catching? Yeah. And we started with single leg balance. Well, jumping and running fast, actually, you start them off on a little 11, teach them to jump off it and land. And then a little bit higher. And then they start jumping off things themselves. And you remember, actually, kids who develop and are very sporty, what are the one things that mums and dads are always trying to stop them doing? Jumping off the couch and leaping off things and landing. And it's a precursor to athleticism. Children are learning how to stop and to be safe through practicing it. Well, one and, one and, thing we learn yeah. in the weight room is using our eccentrics. If I was trying to make your bench press really good really quick, We'd do negatives. We'd put a little more weight on the bar, and I'd spot you and say, slow it down. And if you think about it, kids that climb onto things and jump off of things are using their eccentrics for landing, and they're building their braking system before they add horsepower. The funny thing is they're getting horsepower in the background because eccentric training is one of the quickest ways to get strong. So kids jumping off of things is really learning how to jump higher, but they're also fixing that landing in the process. So, And, and all I would say to people, I've, is the one thing I've learned about what you're talking about there, Gray, in my experience, is you're talking about neurology. You're talking about training the brain to recalibrate all the time. And this is the thing. Once you flip out of the mindset that the body is about physiology and start realizing it's actually all about neurology, um, then you're, you're on a different journey then. And so hats off to you guys. Uh, hats off for fighting the good fight in the, the strength and conditioning world and the pro sports world. I think people are coming around to it. I think people are understanding. Uh, and uh, I think they're, they're, they're understanding there's an, an, another way to look at things and to get results without having to do 10,000 repetitions of something to train the body um, by hacking um, different ways into how the mind works and how the brain works, you can you can achieve a lot. We're, we're going to hopefully do that in schools in the next five to 10 years and hopefully leave a, leave a legacy. Well, Peter, I, can, I can't tell you how proud 
we are, uh, Gray and I both are, to, to work with you, develop this relationship and partnership. Because as you said, I, I really feel like with what you've developed and the feedback you've already gotten to start this, um, you're going to be touching a lot of kids, a lot of schools, um, because it's doable. I mean, you've proven it's doable. Um, so re- really, really excited to see where this is going to be going, because I think it's going to be going far beyond uh, the UK and, and around the world here, here sooner, soon, soon. Um, based off everything you've done. So really happy for everything that's happening. And uh, hopefully if, if anybody's interested, I'm sure we can get them connected. Um, FM at functionalmovement.uk. Um, Gray, any final thoughts? Yeah, I, I want our listeners, including me and you, to take a couple of lessons away from this. Number one, uh, you're a 20-year pro athlete veteran with a foot drop. Uh, you had no choice but to compensate. How many of us are looking for excuses not to become a better version of ourselves? You, you didn't accept it. I would have probably told you not to play. He would have probably told you not to play. You played anyway. God bless you for that. The other thing is I, I, I so much appreciate your mission in let's remove all the reasons for compensation that you don't have to learn. You had to learn how to compensate, and there was no choice in the matter. How many of these kids don't have to learn to compensate from something easily preventable. And that's just, let's up, let's up that movement nutrient and watch what happens. And thank you I for just, doing uh, that. i just finish off and just say, look, um, also congratulations to Lee, um, because I, was, I, I, was, I wasn't convinced he would get a word in edgeways with you and me, Gray, on this <laughs> podcast together. So I, I, I reckon I'm a pretty good combination for, my wife says I can talk for England. So uh, well done, Lee, today. We, we, we got you in there, pal. I, I, told, I told Gray, all I would need to do today is throw, throw the ball up in the air, and then I just sit back and watch you guys bat it back and forth. You didn't think <laughs> he's going to get to come off the bench. Always a pleasure talking to you guys. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Appreciate thanks, it. Peter. Thank you. Enjoyed it. See you guys. That will do it for this episode of the Movement Podcast. Thanks for listening, and if you liked what you heard, please take a minute and subscribe and review. If you want to learn more about our system and take the next step in your own movement journey, visit us at movementpod.com. Until next time, be sure to first move well, then move often.